Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, the ICRC here, the Blavatnik ICRC, for the invitation. On behalf of the uh, Ministry of uh, Economy and Industry, it's a real pleasure. I would like to thank the, uh, the conference chair, Professor Ben Israel, for the invitation, and of course, the team of the ICRC, especially uh, Gilly, Drob Heistein, and uh, the rest of the team for the collaboration. So, as, as uh, it was presented, uh, we're going to discuss the decade of cyber that uh, just uh, elapsed and uh, the decade ahead. Uh, to get us going, I'm uh, really pleased to invite to the stage uh, the first speaker. The first uh, on our panel will be uh, Professor Eviatar Matania. Uh, Eviatar is the first and the former Director General of Israel uh, National Cyber Directorate, known today as the INCD. He today also acts as the co-head of Israel's AI initiative he, and also the head of security study program in the School of Political Science, Government and International Affairs here at the Tel Aviv University. So please, Eviatar, the stage is yours. Um, good afternoon to the very few people that uh, stayed here to hear us. Um, we will not let the very few people that are here uh, to destroy our panel, and I will feel even more free to talk about what we want to talk, since we have just uh, very few people here. So, uh, I thank the ICRC and Ben Israel for the privilege to be here for the ninth time uh, out of the 10 conference that we already had. And the objective of this um, session is to try to go and uh, look at the issue of cyber and cyber in Israel from the uh, top mountain point of view, to try and figure out where we are coming from and where we are going towards what we should aim towards, and how the next decade is going to look like. Not just the next year or two years, but what and how we should shape the next decade when we are talking about Israel and cyber. One may ask why I'm talking about a decade, a decade ahead, and looking for 2010. And I will tell you that uh, Different people may point towards different points of time that um, maybe the Israeli cyber has started. There are those who will point towards 1993, where Checkpoint was established. Checkpoint is still um, the biggest cyber company in Israel. There are those who will point towards 2002, when the government of Israel adopted a very pioneering resolution uh, regarding the defending of Israel critical infrastructure in the cyber domain. Others will talk about the IDF and what it did during the first decade of the century. And there are a lot more to say. And all that they say is right. I do agree with them all. But I would like to point towards the tipping point that from my perspective happened between the end of 2010 and the beginning of 2012. This was the tipping point of Israel and cyber. The real start, you know, a tipping point is where the pace is changing, where everything is in a different pace and becomes really different from what was before that. It all started with the, a very interesting visit of uh, former prime minister, Netanyahu in uh, Unit A200 towards the end of 2010. He was uh, welcomed then by the uh, um, commander of the unit, then Gen Brigadier General Nadav Tzafrir, and by uh, General Kohavi, uh, who showed him, together with a lot of officers and soldiers in the unit, an uh, interesting issue about cyber and intelligence. Uh, Netanyahu was overwhelmed, 
And further to this uh, visit, he asked his um, uh, military secretary, he told him, you know, there is something much bigger than what we have just seen. Much bigger because what I see is that a small nation state can be a superpower because cyber enables a new way of power that we haven't known before. It is also a new risk, specifically for small countries who suddenly become the neighbors of other very big and sometimes superpowers because we have no borders in cyber, unlike physical borders. So Russia, US, China, and all the others, and Iran, they are all neighbors of us in the cyber domain. So I see here a new risk that we haven't yet seen. And I see also a new opportunity for those who can combine between technology and security. But I don't know what to do with it, deal with it. So General Locker did the most Israeli thing that could be done. He called his friend, Professor Ben Israel, then was not just a professor, but also the head of the R&D Committee of Israel, and told him, we need to do something. We need to recommend to the government what should be done in order to take all these ideas and to take the cyber as the next issue of Israel. One of the things that Professor Ben Israel did was to ask a PM Netanyahu to read a, a book, Babel Minute Zero, in Hebrew, Babel Shat Efes, because he told him there is, this is fiction, but there are no non-fiction books or paper that I can give to you in order to understand what the cyber is really going to be. So the prime minister read this book, and after reading it, he said, I now understand it much better, do something. And then the uh, committee that Ben Israel headed recommended to the government who adopted it in August 7, uh, 2011, to establish a national cyber bureau and to lead Israel into being a cyber power. The rest is history. This decade shaped Israel and cyber in a different way than we were before. That's why I am pointing towards this 2010 to 2011 as a tipping point in Israel and cyber. $60 million, these were the investments in cyber in 2010 in Israel. $3 billion, 50 times the investment in cyber in 2020. In 2010, we had only a strategy regarding critical infrastructures. Today, we have a comprehensive leading strategy in the world of how to defend our assets, the whole civilian sector, and you have a unique structure in the government, and that's how we did. We didn't have it before, and we are leading in cyber defense. There is still much to do. And if talking about cyber attacks just a decade ago, we know that attack and cyber attackers and cyber attacks are not cyber power. There is a real difference between making the cyber one of the powers, a real power in what the nation says to do, and just to talk about cyber attacks. So we have done a lot during this decade, but the real question is where we are going towards, where we should aim towards, and what is going to be in the next decade. And I'm talking from the top mountain point of view. That's why I asked, I think, the, mo the most interesting people to be in this session and to give their ideas about what is going to be. Professor Ben Israel didn't know exactly what is going to be in the last decade in cyber. He didn't know what uh, cybersecurity strategy Israel should adopt. He didn't know exactly that cyber attacks will become cyber power and so on, but what he pointed towards was how to structure the Israeli um, organizations and what we should think about and what he take into consideration in order to be here today. And what I ask Ben Israel to do again here is to try and say what we should do, not knowing exactly what will happen in the next decade, 
but from general point of view, what we should do in order to sustain, and much more than that, our cyber capacity and our leading position in the world. Then I will ask my friend, Brigadier General Asaf Kohan, who he just released from his military service as the commander of Unit A200, to talk about cyber power. In 2010 then, in Netanyahu visits to A200, he was just Lieutenant Colonel. Today, he has a real view about where the world is going towards, what deterrence means, cyber power, everything. I ask him to tell us where we should aim, not just where the world is going towards in the next decade, but where Israel should aim, talking about cyber power. Yinon Kostika was under my command in the army and uh, graduated from the unit A200 and then was uh, a startupist in, in, in a company named Adalom, acquired by Microsoft. He saw the American corporates and today is part of a next startup named Wiz. I think he's one of the best people to come and tell us about where we are going towards. Can we be even bigger than we are now in cybersecurity in the world? We're responsible for one third of the unicorns, for 40% of the investment in cyber. Can we be even bigger than this or no? So what we should do in order to sustain and what we should do in order to be even bigger because if we talk about sales, we are not there yet. We are just 15% of the world and not more than that. And we will end with Guy Philippe Goldstein talking about imagination because if his book influenced even a little what happened to Israel, I will ask him to talk about how he see from the fiction point of view the next decade and how it's going to influence our views. I will end with just one point that I would like to put on the table regarding the next decade about Israel and cyber. The very unique issue of cyber in Israel is that Israel is the leading power not just per capita. In most issues, we have some leadership per capita in the number of patents, in IP, in a lot of other things. But cyber, the cyber digital arena, is the first issue, the first thing when we have an absolute leadership in the world one of the big three, wherever, and you count it. This is changing the Israeli strategic posture in the world. This enables us to be much more, uh, I will call it, powerful in the world, and the whole technological posture of Israel, based on the cyber digital arena, is something that if we will have the ability, the thought, and the understanding of how to take ahead, we will be able to see ourselves in a decade ahead in a totally different place in the world. Our posture will be different if we know how to deal with it. So I thank you all for remaining for this session. I hope it will be interesting. Ami, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. It seems that the discussion that we have taken upon ourselves is really broad and mind-provoking. Um, and a few of the points that were briefly mentioned deserve a really uh, thorough discussion. I hope we'll be able to, uh, to do our task. Uh, up next in our list of the speakers for this uh, session is uh, the chairman of the conference, uh, Major General uh, Isaac Ben Israel, the head of the ICRC. Isaac, please. The stage is yours. Good morning again. As long as we still have hope, it's morning. 
Um, I will not talk now on the, what happened in the last decade because I think it was covered uh, during the whole day and, uh, and especially by, by Evita, Professor Matania. And uh, so I will talk more on the next step. I mean, what should we do in order to maintain the current status of Israel as one of the leading countries in the world in cyber technology? And it's not so simple because, as I already said, uh, uh, the rate, the pace is, is enormous. And if you have to run very fast in order to stay at the same place, Today, we, uh, Israel is something like 10% of the global market. In terms of investment, business sector investment, it's almost half of, I mean, almost half of the investment globally, business sector in cyber, comes to Israel. Almost half, more than 45%. It's a huge number. And, and the question is, how do we maintain it? And the answer is very simple. Like what we did previously in cyber, we have to find the next technology which meets the constraints of Israel. That is, we are a small country. We cannot uh, compete with others in numbers. I mean, compare us to China or the USA. Uh, we cannot compete in numbers. We uh, should concentrate on areas in which we have relative advantage, and the only advantage, the only real res resource that we have here in, in Israel is human capital, so we should put an emphasis on this. We should select a subject which does not require heavy investment in infrastructure and expensive uh, uh, infrastructures. And you combine all this together and you come, uh, you uh, feed it into a computer and it comes with a, a simple answer. We should, uh, the next step should be in artificial intelligence technologies. Cyber and beyond cyber, not only uh, in cyber. Cyber is uh, simple. We already, a few years ago, when Aviata was still the, um, the uh, head of the, what nowadays we call the National Cyber Directorate. Um, we already started to use uh, machine learning and AI technology to protect our networks, to identify anomalies, and then to use these uh, 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 anomalies in order to filter out suspected uh, series of bits without going to the level of content without the need to decode it and by, thus, by doing this, breaking the privacy of, uh, penetrating into privacy of people. We started it a few years ago. It's more complicated now because again, it's a, this uh, um, technology which developed very fast. We already were asked by the previous prime minister, when I say we, I mean Professor Vieta and me, to submit to the government a plan of uh, uh, um, uh, um, a plan for for the for Israel. I mean, a national plan to uh, uh, put Israel, as we did uh, some ten years ago, put Israel at the list of top five countries in artificial intelligence technologies within five years. The plan is waiting for a solid government with a budget because, as you probably know, in the last two or three years, we didn't have a budget, and without budget, the government can, cannot do much. And, and if you ask me what is the next step, what we have to do in order to stay, uh, to keep our current status today, is this is the answer, artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ben Israel, for, for those uh, remarks. Um, 
It seems that you started to answer the question that perhaps we can discuss later about uh, how in the next decade, the decade to come, we, we can sustain what has been created uh, in Israel and what would be the challenges really that we're going to be, uh, we're going to be facing. Uh, up next uh, will be uh, Asaf Kohan. He is the former commander of uh, 8200 uh, units in the, the IDF. Uh, Asaf, please, uh, the state is yours for introductory remarks. Uh, I think Avatar already said that you're going to be focusing on power, but please feel free to uh, whatever you want. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, excited to be here. And uh, the perspective that I'm going to give uh, is from a practitioner's point of view. Uh, we've been doing things and uh, we've been meeting the real world in an applied approach. And this is, I would say, the, the basic theme of what I'm going to just uh, uh, talk about. So, starting by the question that Eviatar laid out about what is cyber power, um, I would say that I would start saying that cyber power at, at the beginning and before everything else uh, creates uh, some kind of an advantage uh, for the, for the um, entity which holds it. Uh, it might be a tactical advantage, uh, it should have strategic components, and uh, it might be applied to national security issues, uh, military issues, and even psychological uh, uh, issues too. So in this sense, cyber power gives you an edge, gives you an advantage over a challenge, over a real world uh, problem, enables you to gain uh, ahead of your adversaries uh, an advantage. The second thing, would be uh, what we call, what, what I define by superiority in the, um, the domain of cyber. So how do you find superiority in the domain of cyber is a, a tricky question because the nature of cyber is, is different. It was invented by, cyber was invented by human beings. It's not a physical uh, dimension like uh, soil, sea, air. So I would start by simplifying it and saying that uh, maintaining superiority has two key factors. One is to deny the ability, deny and degrade the ability of your adversaries to act against you. The second is to enable you to act and perform action whenever you decide. These are the two components which must be looked at. Uh, when looking at this uh, term of superiority uh, in cyber domain. The third uh, component which I chose to uh, uh, speak about is, is the capacity. Capacity is when you meet the real world. And in this sense, uh, Israel went into cyber uh, pretty early. Uh, what brought it in is, is, is another discussion. It's, it's an interesting story about why Around about 2000, uh, Israel started investing in it. Uh, Pinchas Buchis is sitting here with, it, with, with us. Uh, he headed the unit during these years, and much of it uh, uh, was, was done by him. But, but in this sense, uh, capacity nowadays, when, when I define it, has to do with the ability to run ongoing campaigns, to maintain persistent engagement with your adversaries, to defend forward, not on the line of the goal, on the line of the gate, to defend forward in the area of your adversaries. And in this sense, uh, capacity is, it requires you to, to, to be, you'll go through highs and lows, but they're persistent and your ability to maintain ongoing campaigns is key when we look at capacity and capacity building. The last point, uh, is people. Um, I, would, I, I should have started with that. Uh, the Israeli ecosystem is extremely unique. We have conscription. We uh, bring in uh, the best and the brightest every year, and we get an amazing, talented workforce at the age of 18, men and women, who come extremely hungry, uh, curious, 
uh, didn't fail much in life, so they're, they dare. They, they're extremely optimistic in a good sense. And we get this massive and extremely talented workforce which enables us to build. And I would say in a nutshell that a lot of what happened in Israel uh, throughout the military and security establishment and throughout the economical ecosystem of the startup nation has to do with uh, conscription. So this brings me to the next point, looking forward. Uh, looking forward, um, I'm gonna mix between cyber power and what I see as the main challenges for the next decade for cybersecurity. So I'll begin by saying that one big story is what happens when cyber meets AI. Itzik here mentioned AI. Uh, the ability to use uh, advanced computation, to use algorithmics, uh, to uh, uh, enable it will create an environment and a world whereby cyber attackers will use AI to attack. The AI will enable, and, and advanced compute will enable them to increase their volume, to be extremely faster in their attacks, to identify misconfigurations, to uh, use uh, uh, unpatched vulnerabilities before they're closed. And in this sense, the volume of the attacks once meet AI capacity and ability will grow and increase. And we will be in a reality, I'm not sure it's gonna be in a year, but in the next decade, we'll be in a reality whereby machines run uh, attack campaigns against commercial entities, so on and so forth. This is a huge challenge, I will touch it in a minute. The second key factor using uh, James Carvel uh, uh, famous uh, quote, uh, it's about the data stupid. It's about the data stupid. So we're blessed to be in a world by digital transformation exists. The ability to uh, store, the ability to uh, chunk and, and, and use advanced computation, the, the ability to transform data into actionable knowledge has never been so real and vivid as it is now. And in this sense, I think one of the key, and, and this is gonna to lead to great prosperity for uh, countries, for entities, for companies, enterprises, societies which will adopt it and move forward. This is something that shouldn't be fought. This is something that the cyber community and the cyber establishments should endorse and push forward. It has to do with prosperity. Uh, in a very wide aspect of prosperity. And I think one of the key challenges, because digital transformation requires massive data flows, it requires uh, immense endpoints, uh, a, lot of, uh, 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 a lot of entities touching the data, developers, uh, end users, analysts, uh, much of this data is now not living in a physical parameter. The physical parameter is something of the history. The virtual parameter is also changing. So in this sense, I think one of the main challenges of cyber, uh, the cyber security community in the next decade will be to adjust and to go into a new paradigm of how to protect data. In many senses, data is a new parameter. And without enabling the protection of data throughout digital transformation, there will be massive setbacks. So this is another key point which I'm uh, emphasizing, and, and it's going to be a major challenge, and, and, and we should move forward and, and, and address it. And, and actually, it requires a paradigm change from the old perimeter approach. The third is workforce. I touched it earlier, soon I'm gonna finish. I think I'm, I'm after uh, the time I got, but uh, generally speaking, there's a massive lack of, uh, of workforce uh, who knows the stuff, who knows how to protect uh, uh, data, who has, knows how to protect networks, who knows uh, the, 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 the know-how of how to do it right. The attack surface is gonna be much wider in the next decade. 
And how do you reduce it? How do you, how do you, how do you compensate? How do you make, uh, I'm talking about Israel because Israel has a, 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 an edge on that. Uh, how, how do you address this issue? In five years, it's gonna be much worse. So in Israel, we have an edge. We just have to be sure that we maintain it and keep it. I think in this sense, programs like Magshimim and academic programs like Talpiot and like Sagot and like many others, Aronim, Broshim, I'm not going to go over all the programs, but specifically in, uh, in, the, in the end of elementary schools and high schools and the ability to address cyber and cyber and AI as a profession, this is a main responsibility, not just of uh, the state, the state should address it. I think private sector should put its hand and be in this because this will promote and create great prosperity in the future. And without it, we'll be in a grave, grave, grave situation whereby uh, we're living in a world I, I just spoke about when cyber meets AI. Uh, this is it. Uh, I have a few more points, but I'll stop here. I think I took much more time than I uh, intended, so thanks very much. Thank you very much, Asaf. Hopefully, it will be. Hopefully, we'll be able to uh, to continue the discussion uh, uh, later on. Um, up next, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Inon Kostika uh, from uh, Wiz. Inon is the VP product and also a co-founder of the company. Maybe you can give us a bit about the uh, the industry perspective, please, Inon. Okay, thank you. Um, so going uh, over the past decade, um, I think that uh, everything uh, was, was mentioned. I think that from the, um, basically from the ecosystem perspective, uh, the, there are three dimensions to the success and the inspiring uh, success of, the, uh, of Israel. The first one is the talent. And I think that it was mentioned, the, the ability of the IDF uh, to recognize the immense power of cyber and train the best and the brightest uh, very early on, uh, actually gave the first wave of talent that went into market during the past decade and created a very thriving uh, ec ecosystem. And when we think about the ecosystem, we tend to think about startup nation and the startups, but it's much deeper than this. It's basically the ability to have startups side by side with uh, multinational research centers, uh, multinational development centers like Microsoft, IBM, you can see the logos next to me. Uh, basically also having the cyber giants like the, the Checkpoint, like CyberArk, all operating side by side on the same talent. Um, and this, and it was mentioned by, by the uh, 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 global speakers earlier, this has made Israel part of the global ecosystem for cybersecurity, and this is significant. This is significant because it makes, like Avatar mentioned, Israel one of the absolute powers of cyber. And the third thing that actually makes the pillar for the ecosystem here is uh, the investment. So we talked about the cyber uh, as an uh, investment, uh, uh, like more than 40% of the investment in the world in Israel. And this, is, this really fuels that ecosystem. So when we look at this truly inspiring uh, cyber journey, and I felt it myself going from 80 to 100, where we weren't allowed to say cyber outside, then founding uh, Adelom, one of the first security startups being acquired into Microsoft, running the cloud security group, one of the largest cloud security operations in the world here from Israel. And then also we're founding Wiz. Uh, Wiz, I don't know if you're familiar, it's a, a cloud security startup. We started a year and a half ago, and we are a, called the fastest security unicorn in the world, globally. Less than one year to getting uh, uh, to a unicorn. So I think that in the next decade, what we will see is many more of these uh, global uh, cyberists going into the industry, and they're not very interested in doing a fast exit. Uh, they are mostly interested in building cyber giants that will build a business and will sell. So we want to be only 15% of the global uh, um, sales uh, in cyber, but we will get to much higher percentages. 
And we can see the names. Again, you have it across the board. You have Cato Networks for Networks, Nix for Developers, Wiz for Cloud, you have Axonius for uh, Asset Management, Armis for IoT. All of these names are unicorns that are really conquering the market. Uh, and they are building the next cyber giants that will be like the next wave of crowd strikes that we know of today. Now, when we talk about the industry, the first thing we hear a lot is about the bubble. Uh, is it a bubble? So I actually, really, I feel compelled to say that, and we've heard it across all the, the, the speakers today, it's not a bubble. We are actually in, globally, we are in a huge security debt. Uh, we talked about digital transformation over the past decade a lot. Uh, software becoming the new oil. We, every single business needs uh, this fuel. And basically, security was uh, left behind. Uh, it was left behind. We are not operating with a security by design. We are not uh, operating with a security by default. And I think that one of the most critical things that we need to understand that we have an immense security gap right now. And COVID only accelerated it, only increased the gap because of the adoption of digital uh, uh, technologies. Now, if we think about the threat actors, over the past year, we have witnessed two terrifying trends that we have to recognize that were talked about, but one is the automation of the attack, the ease of operation as an attacker. And the second one is really the ease of monetization of the attack. We used to think about uh, uh, cyber threats in terms of IP, intelligence for nation states, for competitors, but now it is actually monetized in dollars, in bitcoins, actually. Uh, but this is one of the biggest threats we see. When a startup gets to efficient operation plus a, a ability to monetize, how do we call it? A unicorn. And basically what we're seeing now with the cyber criminals is the raise of the, let's call them the dark unicorns that will really change the way our lives, and we've seen it from the uh, national speakers, the UK, Germany, Canada, they are seeing this threat happening in reality. They impact our lives as individuals, as small businesses, as enterprises, and this goes across the board. So these dark unicorns that now will be facing the blue unicorn, blue and white unicorns, right? So this is going to be one of the uh, most interesting uh, advancements that we will see in the cybersecurity space. And when we think about the market, Every single business will need to go not only through a digital transformation, but will need to consume a lot more security products. Every single business will need to become a bigger consumer of cybersecurity products and go through a cybersecurity transformation, if you may. And this will drive a lot of the additional budgets that we will see going into the industry. And we talked about the workforce. How will we train all of these new network security professionals. The reality is that we won't need to train just security professionals. Security will have to become a, a, a piece, like a part of our, everybody's life. So we started with talking about DevOps security and developer security and IT security. Not only security teams need to know security and employee security. How do we handle our email? And if we think about employee security, what about individual security? What do I do with my Gmail? What do I do with my Google Drive and the like? So if we think about the uh, uh, security market, we will actually witness over the next decade, uh, I call it like a cyber consumerization. Whereas until today, we thought about cyber as a thing of nations and uh, uh, enterprises, but the reality is that it will get to each one of us and we will need to be very effective in protecting ourselves. I'm taking an Israeli example. Uh, you don't have much police looking for bombs in the streets of uh, Tel Aviv. Every single citizen, once we see like a, a, something unattended, we call the police, we know it's dangerous. How do we do it in the cyberspace? That's something with that we have to be more trained to do at every single level, at the individual level. And this will create an immense opportunity for new cyber, uh, cyber uh, security startups. Israel is still the, cyber na the startup nation. And this will create like a whole wave, uh, as I see it, of additional new areas, new audiences for cloud security products, for security products, not just cloud, uh, because 
as a person, I would love to have my whiz, uh, personal whiz. I would love to have, a, we have a, like an Israeli startup called Mind to protect like the privacy of my own data as an individual. And this is really a next wave of, start, of uh, 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 security products that will go to the consumer, to the smaller businesses, audiences that have never been using uh, 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 security before. What we have done till today, we had an antivirus and maybe enabled MFA. So these are going to be huge. We'll drive a lot of this. So going just overall, I think Israel is really became a, a powerhouse for cyber. We are best equipped today to build the next generation of cyber giants. We, the budgets are only going to increase, and not only within what we do today, also in new markets, new segments that will be, be under the cyber space. So uh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. To, to conclude uh, this session, uh, I would like to invite to stage uh, Guy Philipp Goldstein, um, today an advisor for PwC and Expon Capital on Cyber Defense and Future Studies. He is a lecturer at the Ecole de Guerre Economique, and I think your contribution to the inception of the Israeli cyber scene was already mentioned by by Aviatar, maybe we can say also a word about that. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you to all, uh, and I'm very grateful to be speaking here with this very select uh, audience uh, at this stage. Uh, what I will do is that I will very briefly talk about, and again, I thank Aviatar for the introduction uh, about my little novel uh, back some time ago, and then move about the future, and actually even beyond the next 10 years, because, you know, how about having more fun? Um, and so, again, very pleased to be here in Tel Aviv because basically it's here in Tel Aviv, 25 years ago, that I started you know, as a young student, quite bored during summertime, to lay out the plan for the novel uh, Babel Shait FS. Um, and basically, you're thinking about two things that were coming uh, in the forefront. Uh, first, uh, the rise of communist China, a nation riddled with dangerous contradictions and eager to threaten Taiwan, and then the rise of cyber weapons, a new type of weaponry with perhaps destabilizing strategic effects. And then, you know, I used my imagination, so what did I do? I just combined both, et voila. Uh, so the book initially was published in uh, 2007 and had a couple of, of predictions where I run very quickly. Uh, first, that actually cyber weapons would, be, would become police instruments used by nation states, not by lawless hackers, you know, even though I discussed that point 10 years ago with people here in the audience. Uh, and second, that there would be a couple of bizarre issues with that type of conflict, attribution, issue around red lines, when is it a nuisance, when you need to escalate, um, and then maybe the case for strategic deception, you're doing covert sabotage at a level never seen before. And all these characteristics would lead to a sort of disturbing assessment that uh, actually those cyber conflicts could have destabilizing effects. And really to stress that point, both in the book, uh, made in the book, I used Robert Jervis' security dilemma and explained both here, actually 10 years ago, and then in a TED talk, and then in a paper for the INSS in 2013, that because A, cyber weapons gave a perception of an advantage to the offense, and B, because cyber capabilities could not be easily distinguished between from being strictly offensive or defensive, then as cyber weaponry would become dominant, the world would become doubly dangerous, the most conducive to global war. That was the future vision. So 14 years later, what gives? Well, you do see thriving cyber criminals, but indeed nation states are the one often doing the most advanced cyber attacks. There's issue around attribution uh, but, and, and, and the demonstration that you can do attribution, but even in the heat of a crisis, you know, sometimes it's not that easy. Um, and then we, you do see those issues around red lines, which are still hard to draw, um, and that can have actually, indeed, strategic effects. And there are countless signs of that from colonial pipeline there recently to actually going back to Estonia in 2007 and Sexnet. But have we seen a global meltdown, you know, as imagined in Babel? Nope. So far, I'm wrong. And yet, in a very recent article, 
Robert Jarvis himself with Jason Healy are doing arguments very close to the points I made initially in that 2013 INSS paper. Past is not prologue. In the future, with geopolitical tensions and new capabilities, we may enter that doubly dangerous world. So thank you, Robert Jarvis. Should I feel vindicated? Well, just in part, uh, and to understand that, now we need to use again imagination and move forward, not 10 years from now, but let's try 15 years from now. So a first huge revolution that we still hardly talk about is that of a world full robotic in 10, 20 years from now. As unit cost of industrial grade robots will collapse, we will be surrounded by smart autonomous machines. But this in turn will greatly facilitate cyber physical shocks. What will be at stake will not be just money, but physical damages and people's lives. A second revolution facilitated by the sensors on the machines I just talked about, and perhaps also the marriage of AI and quantum calculation, is that of sensors everywhere integrated into digital twins, or synthetic representations of factories, cities, and perhaps even human organizations, provided we have advanced cognitive models. But then if everything becomes transparent and can be turned into a faithful model, then finding new attack paths will be much easier. Larger number of attacks will become more easily, easily operational. And with those two transformations, they will change Jarvis' model. Till now, cyber physical effects are still hard to achieve, and advanced cyber attack success rate may not be that high. Actually, we have seen in the last five years uh, also a couple of ambitious nation state cyber attacks that have failed. And if you have a cyber weapon that has a low probability of success, well, maybe it's, it's some use for psychological effects, but it cannot be the spare head of a major military campaign. But if it can become a truly operational weapon with high chance of success when you press the red button, now you will get the interest of decision makers. And for that, you will need to dominate a new domain, the synthetic domain that can simulate future representations of the world. In a way, this is reverse Orwell 1984. In the static world of 1984, Oceania, who controls the present, controls the past, that controls the future. But in the very dynamic world of tomorrow cyberspace, who controls the future will control the present. Who controls those future representations in the synthetic domain will control the future and the present. So how do we defend the future? So very briefly, first to change paradigm. Because of the robotic revolution and the cyber physical risk, many industries may soon become as stringent on cyber security as, for example, the airline industry with security in general. But then for open societies, it will be time to invoke our inner Churchill. First, and it's been talked about actually in the afternoon, accelerate the collective security dynamic among friendly nations, companies, and organizations to form a global security network, what would be called a white net against bad actors lurking in the dark net. And second, to protect truth and data, so easy to identify and model in 15 years, we will need to paraphrase Sir Winston, multiple bodyguards of lies and all sorts of very sophisticated honeypots. So to finish, first and foremost, in this fight to control the future, we will need the edge of imagination. Again, to quote Sir Winston, sometimes imagination makes things far out worse than they are, yet without imagination, not much can be done. That gives you a view of the future battlefield, which means, of course, that you shouldn't forget your friendly sci-fi authors going forward. Thank you. So, uh, before concluding, I would like to, to thank all speakers for the uh, very interesting uh, comments. Um, as I said, there are many, many things that, uh, that we can talk about uh, as what is the expected for the next decade. Perhaps we should make an appointment already now to meet in the 20th anniversary of, 
of uh, Cyber Week and to assess to what extent some of the predictions and the challenges that were presented here, the issue of the workforce, the issue of AI, imagination, geopolitical uh, friction, and the new synthetic framework that was just presented by Guy Philip, to what extent this can be materialized. Uh, so before concluding, I'd like also to recognize uh, those viewers watching us uh, over the internet that could not be with us, and to say that my organization, uh, the Foreign Trade Administration, at uh, the Ministry of Economy, has worked hard to, uh, to uh, support the success uh, of uh, Cyber Week, as we always do. Um, our trade representatives, the trade attaches in some uh, 45 capitals of the, uh, of the world and, and economic capitals, uh, will continue to support the uh, cyber industry, as we always do. We work with the industry, we work with investors to, to help the uh, cyber industry thrive. And uh, it's a pleasure for me to participate in this edition of Cyber Week, to thank again the organizers for the invitation, and hopefully we'll meet again next year with some more uh, extended uh, physical presence uh, in this very room and in the, the other events of uh, Cyber Week. So again, thank you very much, and many, please, you have the floor.